careful about what we, rec what we recorded and what we recorded over. So those two VHS cassette tapes were for us a finite media entertainment world. Each tape held about three hours of material, a movie per tape with some extra space. We didn't have cable TV, which meant we had a total of six channels on TV to choose from, three of which on certain Saturday afternoons would play movies that were laced with ridiculously long commercial breaks. So the two movies that we had were Ferris Bueller's Day Off <laughs> and Bruce Lee's Game of Death. <laughs> you guys seen Ferris Bueller? <laughs> raise your hand if you have not seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Okay. And raise your hand if you have seen Game of Death. Ooh. <laughs> All right. All right, that's good. <laughs> like it. Um, my brother and I memorized both movies, every detail. Today we still quote them to each other. Um, and I'm glad that this was the way it was. I never wish now that we had had more movies. Somehow it was better to know every single last nuance of two movies rather than to have simply enjoyed innumerable others. We clung to our two movies. We examined them as if they were precious stones. And this actually turns out to be a useful thing to do. Without knowing it, I was getting my first master class in dramatic structure. Ferris Bueller's Day Off is about a brilliant and brash teenager named Ferris Bueller, who fakes being sick one beautiful spring day in Chicago so he can hang out with his girlfriend Sloan and his best friend Cameron. There's a heightened theatricality to the film, in part because Ferris directly addresses the audience. Ferris is one of the few protagonists I can think of who undergoes no personal change in the course of <laughs> There's a lot of fantastic, dramatic, and comedic elements going on in this movie, but sadly, I guess, I think I took more storytelling lessons from Game of Death, uh, which is inferior to Ferris Bueller by pretty much any conceivable metric except for Kung Fu. <laughs> but for me, at the time, Kung Fu held a lot of sway. <laughs> in Game of Death, Bruce Lee, who at the time was a young martial arts movie star, played Billy Lowe, a young martial arts movie star. <laughs> Billy Lowe fakes his own death in order to avoid the mob, and then using a secret identity, hunts down all the mobsters and beats them to death using Kung Fu. <laughs> in real life, Bruce Lee shot only half of the film before leaving the project to shoot a much more lucrative film called Enter the Dragon. Lee died before he could complete Game of Death, and the movie languished half complete, until six years later, a new director took the existing footage and added in new material to complete the film. He did this using two stand-in actors for Bruce Lee. Usually these guys were cast in shadows, given dark sunglasses, and for one sequence, even a beard. <laughs> but what's incredible is that sometimes the director would also just use a life-size cardboard cutout of this thing. Which is crazy. I mean, he had his stand-ins, his understudies, who seemed to be fine, but sometimes the director was like, no, 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 for this take, uh, we're going to go with a cardboard cutout. <laughs> but here's the thing, it worked. My brother and I watched Game of Death so many times. We considered ourselves scholars of the film, which is why I could not believe it when my brother told me years later, that sometimes, but not always, two other actors were pretending to be Bruce Lee, and that also sometimes, but not always, Bruce Lee in a kung fu movie was a one-dimensional piece of cardboard. <laughs> How did I not notice that? The hero fakes his own death and then comes back disguised as someone else, but then the actor who plays the hero dies in real life, so the filmmakers fake his life to finish the story. <laughs> I mean, the story is better, the story about the story is better than the story. Or the story about the story changes what the story is actually about. Whatever. <laughs> I'm just curious about the act of paying attention, you know, whether it be a film, a play, a work of art, your own creative project, or life itself. Because I'm constantly frustrated and amazed at how much I never see. I'm amazed at how a sort of blindness settles over us when we stare at the things that matter most to us. And I'm also interested in how we might combat such a blindness, which is to say, how can we try to notice more than what we notice? Now, there's a saying that I love that is, uh, 
meant as an insult towards someone who's absolutely clueless. You're like a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat that isn't there. <laughs> the layers of this appeal to me, as if blindness and the darkness of the room and the blackness of the cat aren't bad enough, when you throw in the fact that the cat isn't even there, that's when you're really screwed. <laughs> and this makes me think about the creative process. When I begin to play, I feel like a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat that isn't there. I feel my way through the dark for something that isn't there. But sometimes I find other things along the way, and those end up being way more useful than a black cat. The writer Sherwood Anderson, in a, in a letter to a friend, once wrote, I'm trying again. A man has to begin over and over to try to think and feel only in a very limited field. The house on the street, the man at the corner drugstore. I love this. I find that I go back to this quotation often. I feel like I have to constantly remind myself to notice things. Sometimes on the subway in New York when I'm angry and pissed off at everyone, which happens more than I'd like, I try to calm myself by imagining everyone and everything around me is an illustration. Suddenly everything has a purpose, because somebody intentionally did that, made her look that way, gave him those shoes, made him take up two seats, <laughs> scratched the window like that. Somebody intentionally drew everything a particular way, and the reason it is such a good illustration is that it got all the details perfect. The artist noticed everything. I think this is also a way of thinking about God. Only God could make everything and remember every detail. The rest of us are doomed to overlook at least one thing, probably many things. It's impossible to notice everything. I'm currently in rehearsals at the Cleveland Playhouse for my play, Mr. Wolf. This is the second production of the play, and I've been working on it for about five years. But every day in rehearsal, I'm having these moments where I suddenly see a problem, or from lucky a solution that has evaded me. And I wonder, why did that take so long? How could I be submerged in this story for so long through readings and rehearsals and productions and not have noticed the deep dramaturgical flaws that were staring me in the face? There's a deeper concern about noticing things that doesn't have to do with writing plays, but just being alive, of being a human being with a limited time to walk the earth and accrue memories. If we're not being vigilant about noticing as much as we possibly can, what are we even doing here? And knowing how hard it is to notice things, like that Bruce Lee might be made of cardboard, or that my play's last scene doesn't make any sense, then what do we do? How do we combat the blindness? How do we notice our own lives racing by? And for me, it's about keeping a journal. When I was in the fifth grade, my family went to India to visit my dad's family and I was gonna to have to miss a lot of school. And so my teacher, Mr. Treeple, uh, instead of giving me three, week work, uh, three weeks worth of homework, uh, suggested I keep a journal of my time there, and that would be my grade. I happen to have an entry from that journal with me here, and I'd like to share it with you. If I can put this up here. I was 10 years old. Saturday, sorry, December 15th, 1984. We had to get up early to leave for Agra. We took a taxi. It was a long ride. On the way, we saw cows, bulls, oxen, and camels. We stopped at a rest stop and rode an elephant and a camel. When we got to Agra, we saw the Taj Mahal. It was the most beautiful monument I've ever seen. It was built by a king when his wife died. The king was so sad that his wife died, he built the monument for her. After we finished looking at the Taj, we went to a hotel for dinner. Before we entered the hotel, we saw a snake. I found this journal a few months ago when I went home to my parents' house. It was in the attic. I had not seen it in 31 years. When I read this, it was obvious to me that the seeds of my play, uh, Guards of the Taj, 
were planted that day in Agra. Now, if this is true, it means that those creative seeds sat in dormancy for about 27 years. It also makes me wonder, what if I hadn't kept a journal? What if Mr. Treeple had just given me stupid homework to do? Would I have written God's the Taj 27 years later? Maybe, or maybe not. But it may be interested in tracking through my journals other moments where I might see that the creative seeds were planted. The habit of keeping a journal did not take off when I was 10, though. I would wait seven more years before journaling again. I was 17 and again went to India, this time alone, without my parents for the entire summer and stayed with relatives there. <coughs> July 14th, 1991. Went to the Calcutta Zoo. It was lame as hell. <laughs> <laughs> There were two cages between you and the animals, so you couldn't even see them, and the elephants were chained by their ankles. The whole place was like a goddamn prison. Anyhow, all the tigers were sleeping like lazy bums, so it was a waste of time. <laughs> Decided not to go to Mother Teresa's tomorrow. I'll go later when Mom comes. Tuesday, I go to Puppy Auntie's house. Finish The Catch and the Rye by J.D. Salinger. It was great. <laughs> Besides the fact that this is very embarrassing, <laughs> and the fact that my handwriting hadn't changed from the 12th grade, um, there's some interesting things happening here. Uh, number one, I'm obviously parroting Holden Caulfield's voice, uh, very obviously and transparently, thinking that was cool <laughs> and original. Um, and, uh, but, but then when I look closer at it years later, I see these weird little clues emerging. My first play that was ever produced out of grad school was called Huck and Holden. And it's about a young Indian college student who comes to America and has to read Cash in the Rye and because of, becomes obsessed with Holden Caulfield and imagines Holden Caulfield in his dorm room with him, except that Caulfield is not the guy we know. It's an Indian kid, a Sikh kid. And this is one of the characters in the play. And I wondered, you know, looking at this, I was like, wow, I wonder, like, how much having read that book in India at the age of 17 made that kind of impact on me. And then I looked even closer and I also see the seeds of Bengal tigers somehow planted in here. These lazy bum tigers uh, in a zoo, in, in a cell, in a prison-like zoo. Um, and it just felt so strange that in this kind of formative trip to India, um, so much might have been kind of planted in my head. And when I go back and I read these ancient journal entries, I realize that I don't always fully understand what I'm writing down, or I don't understand the impact it's having on me. And we don't always understand ourselves. We don't always understand our brains. We certainly don't always understand what it is we're really writing about. We plant clues without knowing it, and we notice things without noticing that we're noticing them. Oops. April 23rd, 2007, 2.28 a.m. Sunday night. Weekend with Keith. Epic day today. To Coney Island with him and Katie. We went up in the Wonder Wheel. At our picnic table, we ate corn dogs, Italian sausages, onion rings. A man and a woman sat across from us eating corn. Katie started eavesdropping before me, so she got more. But the first thing I noticed was the woman returned from getting napkins and said, so your wife's not much of a swimmer. <laughs> and the man, after a prolonged talk, would be, not necessarily. <laughs> the man and the woman were having a conversation about their dead children, presumably from cancer. The man said, my wife can't go to the Upper East Side, I can't go to Central Park. And the woman said, because those are places you went to with your son. Yes, he said. And Katie told me, he said his son loved Coney Island, and yet he was here, surrounded by children, laughing and eating cotton candy and going on rides. We left, although I wanted to stay. Katie and I immediately started talking about it. Keith was too far away and couldn't hear the conversation, but we talked about what we had heard, and Katie got emotional. She said, I don't know why I'm always getting so emotional. Maybe it's because of Virginia, the Virginia Tech shooting, which happened this past week. I put my arm around her, and we passed a concession stand on the boardwalk, and I asked her if she wanted some ice cream, and she did, and I bought her a vanilla cone. It's 2.47. I need to go to bed. I need to get to work. The new play. Gruesome playground injuries. I wrote the title on a napkin while drinking with Keith. 
all his crazy injuries. A girl skated by him when he fell on the ice and sliced, up, sliced open his eyelid. And isn't the girl like Blackwell? She kisses him. He exults, shyly, but unable to contain yourself. And she's put off by it. And after, he tries to explain it. And sweetly, awkwardly, she says, you weird, and leaves. 3.01 AM. entry I just read from 2007, I dug this uh, out the other day as I prepared for the speech, thinking maybe it would illustrate part of the process of discovering gruesome playground injuries. And it does a little bit. <laughs> uh, but what was really much more startling to me when I found this was the seeds that are there are actually for this play Mr. Wolf that I'm in rehearsals for right now. Um, a play that includes two parents who have lost children and bond over their loss. I was stunned to read this the other day because I didn't think I had the idea for Mr. Wolf until four years later, but I think I was wrong. So around the East Village near NYU, there's a lot of guys who sell used books on the sidewalk. And one day I picked up a book called 1920 Diary by Isaac Battle. I had read a book of his short stories in college called Red Cavalry and had liked them a lot. So I bought 1920 Diary to find that it was literally his diary in 1920 when he was a journalist with the Russian Red Cavalry Army as they marched through Poland in a fierce and bloody campaign. You can see in reading his diary that he was forming the ideas and characters for the stories in Red Cavalry. But what I found even more interesting was the style in which he wrote his diary. Throughout his entries, you find he commands himself to write a certain thing. Describe the kitchen, he will write. And then he does. Describe the night, describe the trees, describe the wind. I found he would usually write these prompts in moments of fatigue. Late at night, after a grueling day, he doesn't feel like writing. He doesn't want to remember anything about the day he just had. But he forces himself, don't put down the pen. Describe the orchard, describe the bathroom, describe the night. And these are incantations. Please to oneself to continue to work, to write, to think, to be creative, to plant seeds. It's like Sherwin Anderson said, a man has to begin over and over to try to think and feel only in a very limited field. So about two years ago, I did a project with a third year graduate acting class at NYU. This was a project that had its roots in the joint stock method, where a playwright and a director and several actors develop an idea together. Carol Churchill works this way. My task was to come in with a shred of an idea. Then the eight actors assigned to me would all independently do research on the topic and then report back to me and the director performing their research. And we discussed what they found. And it was altogether a thrillingly creative process. We spent two weeks playing around with the material. Then I took the summer to write a draft. And in the fall, we all got back together and produced a play. The topic I came to them with was I wanted to write about Isaac Battle and his diary from 1920. That's all I said. Besides the diary, I knew precious little else about his life, his work, and the historical moment that he lived through. Now, having eight very smart actors helping me, helping me do the dirty work of early research and inspiration was suddenly like having eight arms. I felt superhuman. I had eight, eight incredible brains vying to notice all the things that I was not noticing. So we found out a lot of interesting details about Isaac Babel. Despite him being a subversive political writer in Russia in the 20s and 30s and 40s, he became friends with the head of Stalin's secret police, Nikolai Yezhov. And then he had an affair with Yezhov's wife. And then he was probably killed or condemned to be killed by his friend for being a subversive writer. And Nikolai Yezhov, for his part, was also convicted of subversion and executed as well, and his picture and the many photographs where he stood right next to Stalin were erased. So I'd like to share with you now the first scene of the play I wrote during the joint stock process with the NYU graduate acting students. And the play is called Describe the Night.
Act One, Scene One, 1920, Poland. The countryside not far from the Ukraine border, night. Isaac, 20s, a member of the Russian Red Cavalry, sits on a rock or a stump apart from the troops. He's seen a lot today. He tries to write in his journal. Describe the night. A patchwork, a sewn patchwork of uh, a sun patchwork of stars. Stars align in a sun patchwork. Describe the air. Describe the fields. Brown. Nikolai, a brusque, imposing soldier, enters, sees Isaac writing. Nikolai lights a cigarette. Isaac senses him, shuts his book, not wanting to speak to Nikolai or be noticed by him. Writing. What? Writing, writing. This is you. Writing. It's what I do. Babel I, correspondent, Ugrosta, wire service. Yes, that's me. It's what I do. Babel I. I stands for Isaac. What? Isaac. What? Isaac. Isaac. Isaac Babel. Yezhov. N. N stands for Nikolai. Yes, I know. I know who you are. What kind of accent is that? I'm not sure. Odessa? Jew? kind of accent is yours? Standard Russian, straight across the middle, little to no affect, man of the people. What are you writing? <laughs> a report for today, wire services, here is the war, here is the war in writing, so you who are not here at the war can know what the war is like. So is that the wire report? No, just writing. Just writing what? In my journal. A journal is for journalists. Now my journal is my diary, personal reflections on my daily life. I don't understand you. Maybe the accent. Okay. Okay, what? Okay, you don't understand me. Army journalist correspondent from Ugrosta, you report on such events as the Red Cavalry does. You send reports across the wire. Such reports are based on observations or, as you say, personal reflections. You have a journal in which you write these, but you report to Ugrosta. Not personal reflection? Not really, no. Then they are lies. I mean, I write facts. Facts, then. Facts are not personal reflections? My diary is just for me to write to myself. I don't understand you, maybe the accent. <laughs> Sometimes I write to myself to make sense of the day. Point is, correspondent babble, the report for today, what of it? Today? Today's actions, what did you write today? Today? Your report, have you written it? Not yet. When? Commander Yezhov, you can be assured I won't. You won't what? You are concerned that I will write about you, what you did today, that I will send it along the wire. Write what you will write. I don't care what you write as long as, you, as long as you write facts, as long as everything is true. I don't know what's true. I'm the worst person to determine what is true. Don't be stupid. True is what happens. False is what does not happen. <laughs> Writers. I don't care what you write. So a man was killed today in Jatomir. This happened. It, I did it in front of everybody, and everybody saw, and the man had an axe. I know. The man had an axe. I know. And so the man was killed. It doesn't matter if he was old. If he was very old, old people fight too, old people die too. If you are old, and if you have an axe, and if you approach a soldier, a soldier like me, then you should expect, well, you should know what to expect. I agree with you, and anyhow, it wasn't newsworthy. It wasn't? <laughs> no, why our services want basic generalizations with a touch of humanity? I have humanity. <laughs> of course. But you don't write about me. Not to date. I'm saying in the future you could write about me, about my humanity. <laughs> course. You're saying you will. If something happens, news will be yes. Right. Well, you wouldn't just make something up. True is what happens. False is what does not happen. There's never enough cigarettes. Describe the night. <coughs> what? The night. Describe it. Which night? This night, right here, now. Why? <coughs> I just described it in my journal. I'm wondering how you would describe it. If we both describe the same thing at the same time, would one of our descriptions be more true than the other? What? No, shut up! <laughs> black. Quiet. Not so quiet, not so black. I don't know, the night can't be described. The night is for sleeping. The night is for smoking, when one can't sleep. Low in the eastern sky over there, Venus. Where? That glow there, Venus is called a morning star, but it's not a star, it's a planet. How did you describe the night? Isaac hands him his book, Nikolai reads it. 
mine is more true than yours. <laughs> it doesn't make sense anyhow. What cat? <laughs> he reads other pages of the book. Hey, don't read the rest. It's personal. Hey, what the hell is this? It's nothing. It's not supposed to be true. Give it back. You said facts. These aren't facts. It's not for the wire report, damn it. It's just my personal diary. This isn't real. Of course it isn't real. I told you that. Give it back. The daughter didn't cry out like this. She didn't cry out like this when he was killed. She simply knelt beside him and cleaned his face. She didn't cry out. And you blame the Poles for this when it was me who killed the old man, not the Poles. Isaac grabs his book. Don't read my journal. Don't lie about me. Have you ever put your nose into the ass of a goat and just breathed in as deeply as you can? No. If you do this, then you can read people's minds. What? That's not, read their minds how? I love, I love reading minds. There were no goats today. But I have such advanced powers of smell that I can smell a goat ass from miles away. <laughs> really? No! None of these things are true. I've never smelled a goat ass. You can't read people's minds. Am I a liar? No, I'm not. I tell stories. Stay out of my diary. <laughs> <laughs> you made all that up? You just invented it? How'd you do that? Wow. I told you I'm a writer. Tell me another lie. Make something up. <laughs> my father was a French spy. Really? No. <laughs> Tell me another. I have seven toes. Really? No. How do you do that? I can't believe how good at lying you are. <laughs> Tell me a lie. How? I make so many. No, I can't. Everyone can. I don't know how. Just prepare to say something true and then say the opposite. I can't. Lies are lies. Are can't. The old man was actually an old woman. And she had, she had 22 children. No, I don't. Know. <laughs> the old man was an old man and he had an axe. Maybe it wasn't an axe. My lie is, the old man didn't have an axe, he had a shovel. And he was going to dig a grave for his son. And he wasn't angry or attacking, but merely weeping. I didn't like the sight of him weeping and dressed in stupid rags, and the idea of digging the grave for his son was disgusting to me, so I cut his throat, and the world's happier for it. Is that a lie? Only you can say. It is a lie. A man attacked me with an axe, so I killed him. You're better at lying than me. Is that really Venus? Particularly visible this month at this hour. <laughs> How do you know about the planets? My wife studies these sorts of things. You would like her. She can tell the future, or so she believes anyway. You would like her. I say to her, well, darling, if all you do is predict the same thing over and over, then it's not really a prediction. <laughs> war. There will be war. What kind of prophecy is that? But here we are at war. Poor thing, she doesn't sleep. Neither do we. And anyhow, we aren't at war, not at this moment. We aren't. Now, look, look, the sky is like a, a chandelier in Moscow. We are like men having tea. And the crickets are some violins, and the horses breathing over there are the quiet, soft murmuring of pretty women in the tea house. Maybe one of them is about to sing. Thank you for listening to me this morning, and uh, as I leave you, I guess I would just say, keep a little notebook, <laughs> keep a journal, keep scraps of paper in your pocket, and every day, or every other day, or once a week, write something down. Something you saw, something you felt, an idea, a worry, a jealousy, a yearning, and then hold on to it. And after a while, go back and look at it and be amazed at how much it changes. Thanks for uh, hearing me today, and uh, I can take some questions now if you guys have any questions.
Okay, so the first question is what it was like. I'll take the second question first. <laughs> um, the second question is about someone uh, warning the administration of Virginia Tech about the shooting and no one listening. How do you choose to tell a story? And what if people don't listen? And I think that um, for a playwright uh, or a dramatic writer, and you're, you're, you're thinking about the landscape, the political landscape, the world as we see it, and the problems that are there, there is an urge, I think, that a lot of people have, myself included, to address some of the urgent, dangerous, horrifying stories of our age in the theater, on stage. And I think that's a great impulse. Um, the, the thing that I have to remember for myself is that you can't just, um, you can't just throw yourself at uh, an idea or an issue. It has to kind of find its way towards you. Um, for example, I was really troubled by the Iraq War, but I had no idea how to find a way to dramatize any of my feelings about that. And I think that's the key, is like you have to find your entryway into a story to make it compelling and dramatic and, uh, and interesting on stage. Otherwise, it's just a piece of agitprop theater and, and no one wants to be lectured at. And so um, I had found a small article about uh, the tiger in the zoo that, was, that affected me in a real deep and visceral way. And I found that this was my way into talking about uh, the Iraq War. I had this tiger who was a narrator who could talk about it that was um, apolitical. It wasn't an American talking about Iraq or an Iraqi talking about Iraq. It was like this wild animal who had no idea what was going on, and a ghost for that matter. So it was, um, I was already kind of lifting myself out of like the nuts and bolts of the political arena and writing a ghost story. So I think that um, when you're dealing with kind of especially like volatile issues, um, as an artist, I, I think it's, it behooves one to kind of find your way into a story organically, rather than saying, I gotta write about this because it's important for the world, it's more about how it's important for me as a writer. As far as Robin Williams, he was just terrific. He was a great, uh, great performer. Uh, he never deviated from the script like many of us thought he might. He was, uh, <laughs> he was, uh, he, he was a, one of the interesting things about him is that he was very, uh, he was a great castmate for the other actors on stage. and he. Um, was always conscious of the fact that he had taken someone else's job. The guy who played the Tiger in Los Angeles, Kevin Ty, this great actor. Um, when we went to Broadway, they needed to get a movie star, you know. And uh, and Robin kind of was conscious of that, and uh, was always very, um, you know, had a lot of humility surrounding that. And uh, he's a great man. Uh, we're performing Crucible Playground at University next year, so I'm one of my favorite plays. I'm really interested to know. Uh, we're performing Crucible Playground injuries at our university next year. I'm very interested to know about the you know, wide variety of experiences that obviously happen within that show, and uh, I guess your personal connection to some of those stories uh, that you'd be willing to share with us. You know, Some of them obviously relatable to everyone, some of them very specific, and I'm interested to know how many of those actually came up in your life that might be based on something that you actually know someone that's experienced or something of that nature, versus how much of it was purely out of imagination. <clears throat> well, like we saw in my journal entry before, uh, it, 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 it did come from a conversation I had with my buddy Keith, um, and he was telling me about all these injuries he had accrued in his life, many of which are related in that play. And we talked about them, and I had I known him almost my, my whole life, and I hadn't known that so many of these things, terrible, awful, grotesque things had happened to him. And I started thinking, like, well, if you wrote your memoir, uh, every chapter could be an injury. And that made me think about marking, like, the story of one's life through the injuries that we have endured, and that led to a thought about like what you could you could chart a love story that way, and it, it started to emerge of a dramatic question: Why do we sometimes hurt ourselves to gain someone else's love? And it's a, pro, uh, and a provocative question to me, and I think it's the the question that both Doug and Kayleen are, are grappling with. How would you describe your process with writing? Is it very methodical, or I guess just what is that? And do you have any advice outside of journaling and writing for future writers? Um, my process is different for every project, it seems to me. I think that uh, sometimes I will outline a work and, and try to adhere by the outline. Uh, other times I just start writing scenes. Other times I just do a lot of note taking about a, pro a project. Um, but I think if there's one kind of constant, it's that um, my rewriting is so uh, intense. And um, the early drafts of any of my plays, um, almost none of them actually resemble the play that ends up being. Characters are changed, are cut out, are added. Um, the entire approach might be changed. The, the lens from which we're watching it is changed. 
Um, Guards of the Taj uh, used to take place over 40 years in these two guys' lives, and I, I had to change that after writing a few drafts to make it over a few days. Um, some of my other plays have just been entirely different types of entertainment. Like they've gone from being uh, dramas to being comedies, or vice versa. And so uh, <clears throat> I always feel like you don't know what you have until you have a full draft of something, and then you have to start the work on it. And so it's um, it's a matter of grappling with that and kind of um, as if it, like I kind of always see the idea of like being a sculptor, and like the first draft is the piece of clay. And so now you have to start actually shaping it and making it into something uh, that makes sense to an audience. Uh, yeah? Um, I was just curious about, uh, you talked about returning to the Playhouse. Yes. Uh, and you're, uh, uh, with Garth Vitaj and like, and like um, Bengal Tiger and the Bad Zoo, uh, various like places within the United States without. I'm just curious, like, being from Cleveland, like what maybe like some of like the playwriting, or, like writing groups in general, like what what uh, how Cleveland is like influenced you, like your hometown. Are you from Cleveland? I was born in Cleveland, but I'm yeah. most of it. Um, this is really my first play that's been done at a major theater in Cleveland. Um, it's been um, it's so it's very exciting for me to be there. I grew up kind of going to the Cleveland Playhouse, and um, and so it's very exciting to be there. And I think that like. Growing up there, there's a lot of arts in Cleveland, and um, I, was, I was exposed to a lot of it. But I didn't think I wanted to be a theater artist until much later in my life, um, well after I had left it. So I look back on the experiences there of the plays I saw, the music I saw, as being kind of like, you know, like, like, like in this presentation, like early, early seeds that I didn't even know were affecting me the way they were. I used to work at this outdoor arts venue called Kane Park, and um, I used to, I was a garbage man there. I literally would empty the trash and clean the house. It was a big amphitheater. But I would watch the musicals that they did every summer, like so, uh, like, you know, like repetitively. I'd watch every night and I would absorb it, not thinking that I was studying it, but I was. And uh, again, it's, it's like that, I think the act of repetition, um, ingraining something in you, uh, is, is something that's really helpful um, in terms of studying the craft, no matter what you might be doing directing, acting, designing, writing. Um, I think that to, to experience a, a piece of art over and over and over and over and over again so that you know it inside out is a, is a really useful uh, endeavor. Uh, yeah? You get a shout out, I think I can hear you. Um, did you talk about a time in your life where you found a strong artistic block and how you worked through that? Um, and perhaps in the same breath you could talk about uh, a time when you truly feel like you have failed and how that influenced your work? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, being blocked and feeling like I have failed. Um, let's see. I, I feel blocked often. Um, and um, I, you have a million ways of like talking about it, saying like, I advise people all the time about their blockages while not being able to address my own. You know? <laughs> and, um, it's, um, it just sucks. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how else to, to describe it. I think that like th there's a certain point where you have to start trusting that um, even if it's bad, it's okay. Um, my screenwriting partner in college used to say that like anyone can write um, a, a half a good screenplay, um, but it takes uh, you know a real artist to complete a bad one. <laughs> and uh, it's I think it's a real good uh, thing to remember is that like. Um, it doesn't matter if you have a great idea, and it doesn't matter if you have a great first act. Um, it matters if you complete something and then move from there, like I said before. And I think that as easy as we stand up here and say that, it's something that I, I continue to not believe sometimes. Um, and in terms of like uh, failing, I mean, like, I've, again, it's like, I feel like it, it, failure in my, in my head always comes like, very like retrospectively. Um, I think I'm lucky enough that I don't feel like I'm ever failing in the moment. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like if, if, I'm, if I'm actively working on something, it can't be considered a failure. So only, the only things that can be considered failures are something that you look back on and in retrospect say, ah, yeah, that was a failure. Um, but uh, most of those in my life have less to do with writing and more to do with behavior. Um, and I, what I mean by that is that I have some regrets about how I did not 
assert myself as uh, a person in the room during certain productions of mine. Um, that I let myself be steamrolled by, uh, by theaters or by producers or by directors. And this was early on in my career. I think I've learned from it. But I, I, still, I still wish that I had had a little more grit and uh, kind of <coughs> courage when it came to uh, standing up for myself. Because there's a, there's a trap that I think any young artist is going to fall into, which is uh, you are just so grateful to be given the chance to do something. You know, so you'll be like, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, that's actually a, while there's a, an element of truth to that, because everyone needs their first break, and you don't want to alienate people by being an asshole, but um, sometimes you need to be. And, um, and it's a real fine line, and you know, like it's, it's, everyone has to figure out who they are um, when they reach a different level in their career. And, um, and I still am, and I think that every time I feel like I enter a different phase in my life and career, I'm still figuring out, you know, what that means, and um, but I think it's important to just remember, like at least for me, when, when you ask me about failures, is like that's the thing that I, I feel like I failed at is, uh, is not not being assertive enough in the room. A question in the balcony. Oh uh, yeah. Hi. Um, I, I'm sorry. Um, you mentioned working in both drama and comedy, mm -hmm. and I was wondering uh, two things. One was uh, how do you differentiate them, like in your writing style? But also, you talk about like actually switching something that was a comedy into a comedy, and what is the process about going through that, and uh, how do you do it? <laughs> um, I, I, it's a great question because I, I say that as if I, I see them as like discrete entities, drama and comedy, and I don't. Um, I think that like the funniest shows on TV are dramas, you know, like I think that like like Sopranos and Breaking Bad are two of the funniest shows I've ever seen in my life. And it's because the, the, the comedy works in a different way. When the stakes are high, when life or death situations are at hand, um, there's a certain gallows humor that comes out. Um, I think that, you know, um, so I tend to see, I tend to feel like I write dramas that hopefully have a lot of comedy within them. Um, and I feel that when I have gotten, um, when I started out some plays, uh, the self-importance of them, or the importance of the material, going back to his question about Virginia Tech and my answer about like how do you approach a subject. Sometimes you, I approach the subject uh, too head-on, and so it became too, uh, you know, boringly kind of didactic and serious, you know, and uh, you know, and so like you you have to kind of start shifting a lot in, in there to really discover the character. And I think the, the, what your question really gets down to is the question of character. Um, when your characters in your play or your screenplay are, are well-defined and complicated and um, have a backstory that you understand and suddenly kind of leap off the page in one or two lines and then just and are there, are present, are real, um, then you're going to find, I think, comedy within that. And the comedy can come naturally. It's not about cracking jokes. It's about uh, finding that kind of the, the humor in even the most tragic circumstances. Yeah? Uh, what was the first thing you did out of undergrad, and then how did that help you get to where you are today? You guys hear that? <laughs> okay. Um, the Sorry. first thing I did out of undergrad was my play Huck and Holden that I mentioned. Um, I had written it my, uh, my last semester in grad school. Uh, furiously, it was like not an assignment. I had my other assignments that were plays that were bad. And, uh, and I suddenly was like, no, I have to win the contest. I have to. We had this contest you know, every year at the Dramatic Writing Program at NYU. And I was like, only one person or two, two people got the actual like, a full length play produced. And I was like, none of the stuff I'm working on is going to win that. Like, um, it, it's not going to win. I, I, need to, I just need to write something that's going to win that award. And so over the course of the weekend, I wrote this draft. And, uh, I only had three characters in it because I knew that was one of the things. Like they would only do a play with three characters, <laughs> so I, I wrote it and it won. And uh, and then I added two more characters immediately. The guy was trying. Which was a great, great technique, you know. It's, uh, it's awesome. But then that play it got produced at NYU, and then it, it got selected for the Mentor Project at Cherry Lane by Teresa Rebeck, and uh, it became my first produced play. And, and it really was a chain reaction from there. Some people from Second Stage came and saw that production. They gave me my second production at Second Stage Uptown. And it's sort of like, you know, swinging from vine to vine since then. And so, um, but I got real lucky with that mentor project, which is one of the great, um, 
developmental, you know, you know, kind of institutions in American theater. It's it's still going strong. In fact, this year, eleven years later, I was actually a mentor to a young playwright named uh, Christopher Munoz, and he just had his production at the Mentor Project last month. So it was a nice little full circle thing for me. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> what sets my writing apart from everyone else's writing? Um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, it's a general question, but I, I can tell you this. Um, my, one of my professors in college, in, in grad school, uh, said to me, uh, and that's something I really think about a lot, because one of the things that I think we can all fall victim to sometimes is jealousy. Uh, someone writes a play or a movie, and I'm like, man, I wish it was like, um, Or I just like, man, I, I wish like that career was mine. How come they're getting so much attention and I'm not? And blah blah blah. And this is kind of like one of these self-defeating things that happens. And Janet Nypris, who was my professor at NYU, said to me once. She said, "Here's the thing." She's like, "There's a playwright that I I grew up admiring. He was my contemporary." And she's like, I "Made it. I made this image in my head saying, okay, here's the thing. You can make a trade. You can give them all your plays, and you can take all their plays, and we'll call it even." <laughs> and she's like, "I'd never do." And it's like, no, you would you would never give up your babies like that, you know? It doesn't matter if you think that these are the most amazing things in the world and that they've you know, won Oscars and Tonys and Pulitzer Prizes, like, these are mine. And, uh, and so they become part of you, and they take your identity, you know? And so, like, that's, that's a way of kind of overcoming um, je you know, petty jealousies, but also thinking about, like, the importance of the, the selection of what you write, because what you write and what you, what you produce as an artist is, is really a part of you, and so it's it's just it's interesting to think about that as you as you move forward with uh, you know taking on new projects. One more, I have time for many. There's so many hands up. How are you? So with so much of what we do as artists is try to we look change. Thank you. Is try to change and or right or wrong. So when you approach a work, particularly like the North Pool. How do you humanize a character that, in real life, is a villain or is doing something so wrong? How do you reach that person? Mm -hmm. um, I, there's two things happening. One is that like, there's, a, there's an impulse on my part that I want to make these characters um, sympathetic, even if they're doing terrible things. I think that's, that's a challenge that anyone needs to do. The way to do that, or the, the process for me, was really about seeing other people read it. Working with actors, um, actors are like this most incredible resource for for writers because they read it and it comes to life and you start to see the nuances or the lack thereof. And so you read someone reads it and you see exactly in your mind it was going one way. You you see how it comes out of their mouth and you're like, oh my god, I hate this person. How am I going to not hate them? You know. And um, to me, like in North Pool, is like it's a really good example. It's also like that was one of the most difficult plays I ever wrote because. I just, I couldn't figure out the tone there. Um, it's actually Meredith's big reason why that play got written, uh, by giving me the workshops and the resources in Palo Alto Theater Works to complete that. And, uh, and that was a play also that started off with two characters, went to three, went to seven, went back to four, went back to three, and then went to two. So <laughs> also, had, also had two acts, multiple scenes, and ended up one act, one scene in real time. Um, so there was a lot of moving about the space to figure out you know, what that story needed to be. Take a couple more. Yeah, you back there? Mm -hmm. um, so that's a time where uh, technology is so Um, I, I'm, I think what I, I mean, from what I understand, I mean, like, I think that anything that can enhance a presentation on stage and, and, and make it more theatrical and more interesting and more alive is a great thing. Um, I don't think it, it, it steps in the way of theater, and in my opinion, like, what makes theater great and what sets it apart from TV, film, the internet, everything else, and why I think it's been around for so long is that it, it, it always comes down to actors on a stage saying words that someone wrote. It's this live performance that makes it amazing. And it is this, this notion of us being in a room together, the community of it. Um, so 
mixed media, all that kind of stuff. Anything that can help the show is great. But if those things break down, if your tech person's not there, um, if the lights go out, if the <laughs> sound goes out, but we're still on stage acting it, and the play still works as a play, then that's what's important. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Do I speak other languages? I certainly do not write. I, I speak some French, and I speak the language I spoke in the Peace Corps, which is called Mandinka, but that's a lie, because I probably couldn't speak it at all anymore. That was like you know, 20, 20 years ago. Mandinka is a West African language. Mandinka, yeah. Um, but, uh, but when I spoke French in, in the Peace Corps, I, I, could kind of, I could speak it a little bit. I speak African French. Um, I, I became very aware of why, why and how people could be literate, because I had no no way of writing in French. Uh, I can't. I can't write a thing. If I write it, it's it's just it's it's totally misspelled. And so, I was in my twenties, early twenties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why did become an artist? I'll tell you what. Uh, I became artist only when I realized that I was only doing like it, it, when it became like when I was when I was so disciplined with it that it was like it was something that I would do no matter what, and it wasn't about like expressing myself. It wasn't about like um, entering a contest. It was well after grad school, and when it was like I had three other jobs. And I was going home for the weekend, and I was not going to see anybody because I was like, I gotta get my, I gotta get my writing in. And when it became sort of like a, a labor of love that had nothing to do with anybody except myself, I think that's when I felt I was actually an artist. Yeah. There's so many young actors in the audience today. What would you say to them about working on new plays? Do it. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> I think that like the, I'll tell you that like there are there are the actors that I love. Uh, working with are actors that are nimble and that don't care about getting new pages the day of the show and um, can memorize quickly and can um, and embrace that process and help at writers with that process. And so that becomes a real active way of, it's a, it's a totally different way of being an actor than doing the classics. And they're both great and you should do everything. But um, there, are, there are definitely actors who can't do the new plays. And so don't become those actors. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. What is the one thing you would like to inspire the playwright to leave? Oh, God. <laughs> the one thing? Um, yeah, I mean, she asked me what were the one, was the one thing I would want aspiring playwrights to leave here with. And um, I think that that, you know, <laughs> to just keep writing? Yeah. I don't know. I think that there's like, it's, it's hard work and it's, it's nose to the grindstone stuff, and it's like, um, I think that you have to love it, and you have to enjoy that time alone, and then you also have to enjoy the time with other people. And um, I think that like the, the, the sign that you start to mature as a writer is when you're able to, to hear notes, and discern from the good and the bad ones, and not feel self-conscious about them. Like I'm also, I've done a little bit of lyric writing, but not a lot, and I'm very self-conscious about it. When that, when that comes out, when I get notes on my lyrics, for musicals I'm working on, I get real defensive. And I'm like, no, nah, that's fine. No, it's not, it's, it's fine. It's <laughs> and that's a sign of maturity. And when I get notes on my plays, I really hear them. And I internalize them and I think about them and I can choose which ones I want to take and which ones I don't want to take, but I don't ever get flustered. I don't get flustered when somebody's like, ah, this is a mess. And so, um, and so I can see now that I start writing lyrics, the difference between me and a mature writer as a playwright and an immature writer as a lyricist. And I really need to work on my maturity as a lyricist uh, so I can get to that place where I'm able to hear people. And we really do have to wrap up. <laughs> okay. I'll be around.